I feel a little bit like a sandwich, the middle of a sandwich. I'm not as entertaining as Coke Boligata, although I must say I appreciate him, him playing a dance espanol tonight, nor as inviting as your dinner. And I am the last thing standing between you and your meal, so I know that I have to leave the podium as quickly as possible. I must say that there have been many wonderful and impressive things, memorable things about this conference this week. But to me, the most impressive has been the spirit of people coming together from different countries, all coming together, working on the like cause of reduction of poverty and building housing. People of high ideals, people of great skills, and people from a very impressive region of our world. This is an area that is leading the world in growth and growing in leadership. Ancient and respected cultures in many of your nations now setting the pace for the world. And though over the course of the week we've talked about three Ps, public and private and people, I'd like to offer that there's another theme at this conference in another three Ps. Peace, prosperity, and poverty elimination. Peace, as we see that this is a region of the world that is finding ways to collaborate and negotiate, and thankfully we've come some years since massive conflicts and hopefully recognize the interworkings, the interwoven nature of trade and and, 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 and uh, negotiations that makes it possible to achieve a lasting peace. And the world sees the prosperity that this region is generating. That creates the opportunity to use that time of peace and to use that time of prosperity to engage in serious poverty elimination. Now is a time as never before as historic forces converge stability in the governance of the nations of this region, the forces of technology that create new levels of prosperity, trade, understanding of the importance of building a middle class and therefore moving people from marginalized conditions to create a middle class in all of the countries of this region, and an opportunity to redress the worst degradations of poverty. And here at this conference, in this room tonight, in the meeting rooms and concurrent sessions of the last few days, are a special people, those of you who work in this field of poverty reduction through housing. I want to express my personal respect for each of you, uh, Habitat, government officials, housing officials, community activists, each of you who gives of your time and your talents generous allocation of your skills and your energies for this cause. You have my ultimate respect. As we have said over the course of the last few days, the cause, the theme of this conference, housing as a foundation for breaking the poverty cycle, is a, is a, is a solid concept. These dreams that we've described these ideals, this vision of a region of peace and prosperity cannot be achieved if the levels of poverty remain as high as they have been. No society can carry large-scale poverty and be prosperous. But too many resources have to be allocated to the issues of poverty. It breeds instability and divisions, sometimes on a large scale. And it is an immense waste of talent. In the United States, we have several organizations who capture the message perfectly. One called the United Negro College Fund, whose theme is a mind is a terrible thing to waste. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. It captures the sense of everybody has talent if we can garner it and, and cherish it for the future. We have another presidential initiative that's called no child left behind. We believe in our society. We cannot afford to leave any single child behind. These capture the idea 
that as a society, we're better off if we recognize that we cannot waste talent. We've also said the last few days that we must address the issue of poverty because it is the right thing to do. Civilized people express respect for the talents of every person in the society. And in this group, driven by a group like Habitat, which is more than a secular force, it is a spiritual force, it is a ministry, we understand that every person has an element of God. When I was mayor of my hometown and I was trying to think of ways to reduce divisions and find ways for people to speak together, I became very respectful of the Quaker method of decision making. Quakers who decide not on the basis of a vote, 51, 49, because their belief is that every person has within them an element of God. And therefore, you can't break that wisdom into 51, 49. You wait for the wisdom to emerge because the wisdom of God comes forth. These are the ideas that drive our ideals and commitment to the elimination of poverty. My task this evening, brief as it is, is to try to just capture some of the important principles of the last several days. One of them clearly is that housing is a platform for the elimination of poverty. All of us, though we work in the field, can only imagine the circumstances of people who live in destitute conditions whose housing is uncertain, whose housing is chaotic, whose housing is unsafe. Just miles from where we engage this evening in this wonderful dining hall in this hotel are people who live on trash dumps. And in fact, there was a fire in the last few days because of the trash material that caught fire and people are moved from their homes in other parts of this metropolitan area are people who have no place to build homes, so they find the land that they can, and that land happens to be drainage canals that carry water in times of floods. The water either destroys their homes or is clogged up and floods the rest of the city. Every one of our countries has these circumstances. My own country, the United States, has 800,000 people who live on the streets on any given night. And that number circulates. It's not the same 800,000 people. So in a year, it's over 3 million people who move through conditions of homelessness. My point is that we, f we must find the rec we, 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 we come to the recognition that housing is a starting point. It's very difficult to imagine how people can address the question of how their children are going to have a place to prepare for school or how they are going to prepare themselves for a stable job, or how individuals are going to get decent health care if they cannot settle the question of where they live, if the question of where they're going to put their children to sleep every night is an open question. Will they be safe? Will they be healthy? Do they have a future? In the United States, when we address homelessness, we've come on a new strategy which, we go by, which goes by the words housing first. It doesn't mean housing alone, but it means housing first. We used to think that we could deal with issues of addiction or issues of health, issues of alcohol, other issues, and make a requirement that people address those issues before they could come into housing. But we know that those questions cannot be addressed without housing. How do you possibly address a regimen of medicines without a place to keep medicines, without a place to have a dry, warm place in the winter? So we've come on the strategy of housing first. And I think those words capture perfectly a recognition from this conference that housing indeed is the platform by which we make great strides in the eradication of poverty across Asia. So that's one point that I think we've made the last few days. The other is the significance of partnerships. We've recognized that government has a, the lead role. Some people say 
The government must steer the process, but the government alone cannot row the entire boat. The problems are too large. Government efforts must build on partnerships, the raw energies of the private sector, high net worth individuals and corporations, philanthropy, and of the public, of the, of the people sector, their, their volunteer energy, their willingness to contribute, residents themselves. Government must tap the entrepreneurial and civic energies of the extended society. One of the principal lessons of our time is that centralized national strategies, centralized national strategies can be multiplied by decentralized initiatives. Local government, private society, and the civil society. This is true because the scale of the problems is so large and government can't do everything. It's true because housing needs are place-based. They're in different places around the country and government cannot be everywhere. And it's true because there is something about many minds and many levels of innovation and many levels of networks and many levels of energies that can be unleashed to deal with large-scale problems and government can't touch every one. So the multiplier factor of unleashing volunteers and residents and, and, and so many others makes a difference. Governments must go beyond tolerating, simply tolerating partners, but must welcome and encourage and incentivize partners. Create the incentive structures where everyone can participate in this moment that we've described, the moment of peace, the moment of prosperity, the moment to solve decades-long, centuries-long inequality and unfairness in our societies. All partners, corporations, philanthropy, high net worth individuals and families, non-government organizations, community-based organizations, residents and volunteers. As I said, in, I, I've heard uh, Tony Blair, a former Prime Minister of England who is famous for articulating a third way, not, not capitalism, not socialism, but a third way, talk about the role of government as, as steering the boat, not rowing the boat. We all row together and government helps provide the consensus, listening to people to provide a sense of direction. In this case, housing in poor neighborhoods, collaboration means a catalytic role, a facilitator role, an expediter role, a partner role. Things like, for example, providing land which government can assemble and can clarify legal title and make it possible. I, I had a meeting this afternoon with Senator Lagarde who was talking about people who are living in drainage canals but are difficult to move because they have no place to go. Government can provide land and make it possible for people not to live in unacceptable circumstances, which is in the heart of canals that are designed to receive floodwaters. Government can extend infrastructure. I remember when Habitat for Humanity first approached me as Secretary of Housing in the United States in the 1990s for the first time to talk about pipes for water and money for land and other infrastructure needed. So providing extensions of water and utilities and transportation systems that support communities is a role that government can play. Creative finance, we've heard so much the last few days about housing finance and I congratulate Habitat for bringing uh, Wharton, the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania to do a course. Congratulations to those of you who are gonna get a certificate out of that course. In, in, in mortgage finance and, and housing finance, and creating a regimen of incentives so that people are encouraged to participate philanthropically, to give more because the tax system encourages it. All of those are the kinds of things that government can do to, to set the climate and then unleash the energies of, of private sector, of, of individuals, 
and of the community organizations. One other thing I think we've noted over these last days is the fact that we're living in an urban era. We live in a world in which, for the first time in the history of mankind, for the first time in the history of mankind, more people now live in urban areas than in rural areas. That's never happened before in the entire recorded annuals of human history. Metropolitan areas all around the world are engines of national economies and of the global economy. The new global economy is an urban economy. And that is certainly true in Asia. Not just here in this dynamic city of Manila with its contradictions of wealth and poverty, but also in Singapore and Seoul and Jakarta and Kuala Lumpur and Ho Chi Minh City, Hong Kong and Japan from Tokyo to Osaka to Nagoya, in China, where today there are over 100 cities of a million people. But in 2030, there will be 200 cities of a million people. That is urbanization. And urbanization has created its own force, its own logic. Cities need a mix of jobs, and therefore a mix of workers and a mix of incomes. Therefore, they need a mix of housing types. If the housing is not relatively close to the employment centers, then we generate a need for transportation that requires congestion and, re and sets off uh, emissions, carbon emissions and, and, and climate issues. The large issues of our times, like co climate control, are in great measure urban issues. And many of the solutions that we seek as we seek poverty housing will also be solutions to larger issues of urbanization. So the, this conference and the focus on sustainability, energy solutions, makes all the sense in the world. So does the emphasis in these last days on disaster preparedness. The linkage between climate change, sea levels, more violent weather is real. We heard in a panel today that this region of the world can expect 20 typhoons every year. And at least one of those will hit populated areas and devastate many homes, create economic loss, and worst of all, massive loss of life. As we heard today, the greatest losses of life are in underdeveloped areas where the poorest people live. It makes sense. They live in the lowland, they live exposed, they live vulnerable. So the task is more than relief, more than rescue, more than rebuilding. The biggest job, it seems to me, is anticipation, planning in advance and preparation, recognition that these areas are going to be hit, and, and working to solve issues of poverty housing by helping people in the process of not being exposed in these settings. These are massive and large tasks. Let me close by congratulating, again, the organizers and planners of a very excellent set of gatherings. People have been meeting here since last week, Saturday, in various forms. These last days have included Habitat leaders coming together from different countries, the Asian Pacific Leadership Group. They've included aggregations of givers and philanthropists who have come together in the last days. They've included the Vice President of the Philippines lending his high office to the housing agenda in a very generous allocation of time and effort and staff. And they close with this forum in which some of the brightest people working in the housing field in Asia are gathered together to learn from each other and build on best practices. I congratulate you all on that endeavor. And let me close by recalling the words of the pastor of Dr. Martin Luther King's church, Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, who I read once said the following. He said, if you want to touch immortality and leave a legacy, then associate yourself with causes larger 
than yourself and causes that last beyond your time. Again, associate yourself with causes that are larger than yourself. Each of you is doing that. Each of you has associated yourself with causes that relate to the future of your countries, the future of the people that you love and care about, and the ideals of creating a better world, and causes that last beyond your time. By definition, the homes and communities you help build will last beyond your time. The lives of children who start today at disadvantage but break through and have the opportunity to become somebody in their time that contributes to humankind will last beyond your time. And the concept of creating a vibrant part of the world that capitalizes on a moment of peace and prosperity to break through in a new model of creating real pathways to opportunity for people by realistically eradicating poverty, eradicating poverty through housing. That is a cause that will last beyond your time. Thank you very much for allowing me to be here.